So welcome everybody to tonight's Chaos Chat. On the line, I have Reese Robbins. Say hi, Reese. Hey, how you doing? So Reese, if you guys do not know, is the uh, owner and proprietor of Frontline Gaming. And you know what, Reese? Tell everybody a little bit about yourself. Yeah, um, so I own Frontline Gaming, uh, which you can check out at FrontlineGaming.org if you're curious with my partner, Frankie. And um, we've been in business for just about 10 years now. Uh, we do a, a wide variety of things. Most people know us for our involvement in the 40K competitive community. Um, we organized and started the ITC, and we run several uh, of the biggest, including the biggest uh, 40K tournaments in the world. Uh, the SoCal Open, which is coming up here right around the corner, the Las Vegas Open and the Bay Area Open. Uh, we also have an online store where you can buy uh, gaming goodies at a discount. We make uh, gaming mats, the FLG mats and terrain, the ITC terrain series. And uh, we also have a full service paint studio, which is one of the biggest, if not the biggest in North America, the FLG paint studio. Um, so yeah, we, we do a lot and we're really, really active in the, in the community. Yeah, no, it's all fantastic stuff. And, a little bit about our history, you know, me and Reese, uh, we once hung out on a forum called Daka Daka. Yeah. Which still exists. <laughs> if you did not yeah, know Yeah, it's, it's, uh, God, those were the good old days, weren't they? Oh, yeah, no, and, uh, Reese, I remember, uh, I was on there when he, he started posting on there, and, uh, yeah, we used to get into it, me, him, and, uh, Jimmy, JY2, and, yep. uh, yeah, we we always talked a lot, and and when he first started Frontline Gaming, you know, I actually wrote a few articles for you guys, and then uh, I was very disenfranchised with Sixth Edition, <laughs> yeah, and so I kind of fell off the radar, and then I came back in eighth. So, um, and I'm happy to have Reese on here. I'm happy that he accepted my invitation, and uh, yeah, we're a growing child. So, yeah, it's it's uh it's good to be here, man. Yeah, fantastic. So before we get started, I always have to ask this, and this is something that I failed to ask my first two guests. So, favorite chaos god? Um, if I'm if I'm gonna be real, it's I have to say Slanesh. <laughs> what? Why Slanesh? Well, um, I, I like to not not so much as I've you know gotten older, but definitely when I was a. I'll put it this way: if I existed in the 40k universe. And the the it was pick your chaos god day at college, and there was a recruiter from each god. I know which one I would pick in a heartbeat in my early twenties, and it would have been Slanesh. <laughs> well, I guess that makes sense, you know, college. Yeah, it's th that one was always seemed like the most fun. Um, from a lore perspective, I really like old corn. Uh, current corn is just boring as hell. Uh, but old corn from the uh, realms of chaos days was really interesting because you know a samurai could worship corn, or uh, it was it was a lot more interesting. There was a lot more depth to it, and he was the most powerful chaos god. You know, uh, uh, Zinch destroyed the staff of sorcery because he was worried corn would kick his butt just because he had it. Um, so the old corn, when he wasn't just a rage maniac, when he was, you know, there was a lot more depth to his his uh, persona. I thought that that was really interesting. But now, just the endless blood and skulls, it's really boring in my opinion. Um, I still like corn a lot, but uh, it just doesn't have the appeal I think it did it in the old days. Yeah, no, that makes uh, perfect sense. And you know, GW's kind of taken a more modern approach to the chaos gods. You know, uh, they kind of have their their thing and and we've seen kind of a reinvention of nurgle and um it seems like they're just kind of like going a certain direction with each of the gods yeah and you know like uh zinch is also super cool because you know learning and knowledge and and, and uh gaining power through through uh being studious and having knowledge that others don't is is also really cool too they're all really good but Slanesh definitely seems like it would be the, if I had to be a demon prince of anything, being a demon prince of Slanesh sounds like it'd be a pretty wild party for, for, to enjoy your eternal life. No, that's really interesting. Cause I, I honestly thought you were going to go with corn. I seriously did. <laughs> I, I like corn a lot. And like, I play, I don't play Slanesh. I play a corn army just cause I, I think it's, it's, it's fun. It's very metal, but, um, 
Yeah, from a just a, from a fluff perspective, I always thought Slanesh was the most interesting. Yeah, no, that makes perfect sense. And so, uh, you know, you're you're all about the competitive gaming, and uh, so your current army right now is White Scars. I'm correct. That's what I've been playing lately, but I, I own like 14 armies or something like that, like full full armies. Um, but lately, I've been playing White Scars, yeah, and they are really good and really fun. So one thing that I found really interesting, because I know uh, you went to the Slaughterfest and actually played, right? I played Corn uh, Corn Army at Slaughterfest, yeah. Yeah, and uh, dive a little bit into that. I thought it was really cool because I was like, when I was looking at the list, and I was like, what the hell, Reese is running Chaos? <laughs> yeah, I, I play my Chaos Army like fairly frequently. I'd say it's like my third most common army that I play. But I took um, I took a Chaos Knight, uh, El Mastodonte. It's named after one of my favorite metal bands, Mastodon. Hell yeah. And um, I had a, a Chaos Demon detachment and then a Chaos uh, Space Marine detachment as well. So it was fun. It did fairly well. Like, I realized there was a lot of weaknesses to the list. Like, Tau just steamrolled me. Um, and, like, it was bad. Like, I did beat a Tau player, but it was because I had, like, literally, like, miracle dice um, I beat him. It was my sixth game, and I won because Abaddon made 24 out of 26 four-up saves in a row. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah, and that was the only reason that I won. But um, um, and I lost. Uh, I lost to another Tau player uh, to a Imperial Fists army that had the um, Siege Breaker cohort. When when you have vehicles in your list, that's just really rough. And um, generally, though, it, it performed well. It was fun. I had uh, triple blood letter bomb and uh, smash prints. Uh, and when I actually got to do like all the stuff and get into combat, it worked great. But if I didn't, it just it was a rough game. Yeah, no, that makes perfect sense. You know, uh, blood letter bombs are really really good, but uh, definitely finicky. And if they don't do their job, I mean, they just fall apart. So yeah, like now my more modern version of the list, I think I would actually just take one unit of thirty. Um, and then just pay the extra price because I was taking three units of 20 to, to save CP. But one unit of 30 now because you end up burning a lot of CP on them for morale because they, ju they just get wrecked by morale. Um, so having one unit of 30 I think would actually save you CP in the end and it's more uh, worthwhile to make them double attack and do all this stuff because they, they are really CP hungry. Um, the, the blood letters and I think just one unit of 30 would be more efficient over the course of a game so I know you uh, you don't get a lot of time to play and uh, I find it really interesting that you you mentioned the blood letters and, and you know right now you know everybody's throwing a fit about Marines and I'm sure the storm will pass and whatever happens happens and uh, so do you think that blood letters do have a place in the meta right now regardless you know because I, I was actually talking to somebody today and then they mentioned you know aspect scan with the, the ultramarines and the aggressors would pretty much just destroy a blood letter bomb but uh, <laughs> infiltrators stuff like that yeah I mean I think this is a target rich environment for blood letters they have the opportunity now to just really shine because there's lots of multi-wound marines uh, running around the table, and that is exactly what bloodletters want to kill. So, yeah, I mean, I'm sure all of us could imagine scenarios in which it's not going to be, you know, optimal. Uh, if you're worried about a big unit of aggressors smoking you when you come in from reserves, which is a valid uh, fear, well, obviously you don't deep strike next to him. You'd be a fool to deep strike your blood letter bomb next to aggressor. Like, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, it's just obviously not something you're going to do unless you just want to pick them right back up again. Um, but some of the tricks that I was using to get mileage out of them was, especially if you're playing with ITC terrain, like magic boxes, which some people still throw a fit about for reasons. Um, if you can deep strike them into a box, you can then charge without worrying about overwatch and, uh, or one of the other things that's really common is like the Nova style, just giant L's in the bit in the middle of the table. If you can deep strike behind those, even if it's a slightly longer charge, it's you're going to completely negate Overwatch. And uh, if they go into those aggressors, they're going to give them give them the business in melee 
because they're only going to get a six up save and one in six attacks is going to be doing double damage. So, no, that's true. And and I actually used this the uh, other week where I deep struck some Blight Lord Terminators into the bottom floor of a ruin, charged out and touched bad touched four Lehman Russes. So yeah, exactly, exactly. And that's that's why the magic boxes are, in my opinion, ultimately really good for the game because they allow you to use units that if you didn't have it, they would not be usable. And with the prevalence of Air Force armies being so dominant and the, the, the Iron Hands Air Force especially going to be ruining people's day, you need the ability to hide units, and like completely hide units from them. Otherwise, Air Force armies, especially if they go first, you're just you're dead because there's nowhere to hide. No, that's that's a great point, and uh, a lot of my tips to other people have been to kind of hide. <laughs> I mean, it it, it kind of sucks that you you know you have to hide, and that like there's really you can't stand toe to toe with it. And like I said, ho hopefully the storm passes. I know people are looking at stuff, and, and you you in particular have been you know voicing uh, actively you know hey use terrain rules and and um, so I guess. On the subject of terrain, you know, recently there's been some... You made a judgment call about flyers, which I completely agree with because I've been victim to that multiple times. Um, yeah. With sitting, you know, a Caladius tank on top of a building and making it unchargeable and just ridiculousness. But, um... So are you guys looking at other types of terrain, like forests, uh, and, and maybe implementing more than just, you know, buildings? I, I would love to. I mean, God, it would be so great if if GW would, would just revamp their rules, but like they're working on stuff that's coming out in months, year from now, right? Like that's what their design team is working on. It's, it's hard for them to react to stuff um, uh, because that's just not the way that their business works. So, um, you know, down the road, maybe GW will have something that will address a lot of this stuff. We can all hope for the current time, yeah, if I if I had like a magic wand and I could just say like ta-da, abracadabra, this is all in effect, I would like I've been saying I would take us back towards like fourth edition, where the rules, the terrain rules were abstract, and it it works so much better for match play. I agree a hundred percent with GW that it doesn't work for uh, narrative play or open play, especially not for young players, for like new players, because it doesn't make sense to them yeah. to like when you look at it because you remember you played back then yeah when when like a forest just straight blocked line of sight period yeah. and like a, a kid like a 12 year old kid goes but i can see you why can't i shoot you that makes 100 percent makes sense like let them play a true line of sight but for match play like you were saying you need to be able to hide like to completely hide otherwise it's just a shooting addition so when people complain about you know, uh, ITC ruling for the bottom level of a ruin blocking line of sight. It's they also will complain about it being a shooting edition, and I'm like, you can't do both because <laughs> the <laughs> one is trying to prevent the other. Um, and, and, and abstract terrain would do that, right? Like saying a building just blocks line of sight. Period. And yeah. then you, you can you can model it however you want. It can have windows. It can have doors. You don't have to go physically block them up. Uh, or a forest, same thing. Two. Two inches of forest blocks line of sight, period. It, it just it makes it so much easier on the TOs to make terrain that blocks line of sight, even if it actually physically doesn't. Right, and then you don't have to have every single, you know, uh, table have buildings and, and ruins. You could do forest terrain and these pretty exactly. tables, and they would actually have a functional use rather than, cool, it looks really nice, you know? Yeah, you don't want to punish people for making a cool-looking table in the current terrain rules definitely definitely do that yeah no i don't disagree and and this is actually a conversation i've had with multiple people uh high level and low level and uh to me it's just and i get it you know gw might be doing something it's just to me i'm like uh terrain's an easy thing y'all can just put out like a three-page pdf and fix <laughs> so. i i agree man like it would be super easy in my opinion to fix it and it would make a huge difference in match play like a mass to the to the better in my opinion oh yeah no definitely and uh 
And I don't, trust me, I enjoy playing on ruins and buildings. I, I love that. But as an example, you know, yesterday I played against Iron Hands. So, <laughs> and yeah. I'm going to be releasing this after hopefully that battle report comes out. And uh, so he was playing a short range, like Vindicators and, and that sort of thing. And um, I was lucky he wasn't playing Repulsors because the table we're playing on was gorgeous. Absolutely gorgeous. It's a new shop here. And uh, it was like... If he had set up two repulsors, he had a clear line of sight to me anywhere on the table. And I was yep. playing, like, Mortarian and, and a Lord of Change. And I was like, you know, had you had repulsors, like, I would have not even been in this game. I would have just been running at you for two turns hoping something would happen. Yeah, and, and that's another part of the if it sits, it fits rule um, that people, like, <laughs> were having kittens over. It's like you said, you don't want to have a, a, a situation where repulsors can get an elevated firing position where they have a, essentially unobstructed line of sight to the whole table and that in return, they can perhaps not be charged at all. That's such a bad thing <laughs> to have happen. And, uh, you know, people, I don't know, people, some people didn't see it, but uh, it, it, it just makes a unit that's already hyperpowered so much worse yeah no and and i think it, you know the people who were arguing against it were abusing the rule anyway but um like i guess they've never been on the receiving end of okay i can sit my tank up here all right well i'm gonna try to charge you with the demon prince well the demon prince won't fit now but you're up yeah. there but your it, demon prince it, doesn't fit <laughs> exactly and it's like people were only thinking about how it, it like we had some necron players who were really upset and they, they to be fair they had very valid points that they were making with looking at it from the perspective of their own army. But it was hilarious because some of them were like, well, how are we supposed to beat Iron Hands now? And I was like, don't you think they're going to be doing the exact same thing <laughs> <laughs> to you? It's, it, it goes both ways. Exactly. I was like, it, it's, like, it's going to make it harder to beat Iron Hands when their repulsors can go on top of a tall building and see you and you can't hide from them. No, it's very true, and it's just, it's, I don't know, it was a silly conversation uh, for you guys, I mean, if you want, it's on the SoCal open page, it's still open, I occasionally check in to see what new comments that pop up, uh, new pictures of people putting vehicles in ridiculous positions. <laughs> yeah, and it's, it's like, beyond the, beyond the rules part of it, right, like, beyond the, the it, it's all clearly too good for skimmers, and the, 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 from a new player, like a player coming into the game, like, oh, I want to go check this out. This sounds like a cool thing to do. And then they see these giant hover tanks hanging off the edge of a building. They're going to look at that and go like, that looks stupid. And it doesn't make any sense. Yeah. Like none. It's going to turn people away from the hobby. And you have to think about, like, we always have to be recruiting 100% of the time because people are always like, having kids or a career change or going to college or, you know, life changes. And we always have people walking away. They oftentimes come back, but there's, we're always shedding hobbyists. So you always have to be thinking about not just the game and the way we're playing it right at this moment, but is this going to encourage more people to join the hobby? Yeah, no, that's a perfectly valid, uh, valid thought process. And I'm a hundred percent behind it, you know, and, uh, Every time y'all make a ruling or something uh, goes into effect, I always bring it back to the shop and be like, hey, let's play like this. Because um, obviously that's that's the way forward, you know. And uh, I don't think neglecting rules just because you don't like it. Because, it, I mean, otherwise, you know, nobody would be playing Iron Hands right now. But, <laughs> but uh, yeah. So uh, on the subject of Marines, right? So you're playing White Scars. Uh, so what's your plan going into the... And and this is going to talk more to like just general strategy. You're playing with your iron hand, uh, your white scars when you're playing against iron hands right now. So humorously, uh, we've been doing a lot of statistical analysis on the back end to see just, and I'm sure you've seen this. It's been all over the net lately, but to see really how good are they? Like, let's not just knee jerk. Let's really look at the data and try and make an educated estimation of how good they are and iron hands are broken <laughs> like it's factual like they are op um you they don't break the game or anything but they certainly are too strong they're putting up numbers similar to the castellan list when it was at its peak 
and when it had infinite CP and smash captains and all that stuff. So it's certainly a problem. White scars, humorously or, or not, depending on your perspective, are the only army so far that are consistently defeating Iron Hands. The only army in the game. <laughs> no, and why is that? Like, what, what makes them be able to defeat them? And I, I, pretty, I not, like, I'm not trying to pat myself on the back too hard here. I, I kind of, <laughs> I kind of thought this would be the case. I kept saying White Scar is going to be the Marine Killers, and it's because they have, they have like all the counter tools. Like White Scars are really good at not letting you do the thing that you want to do, and it, it turns out, I, I did not see this coming at all. I thought Ultramarines would do better than White Scars, uh, and I'm wrong. The data is showing us so far that White Scars are actually better than Ultramarines. Um, and, you know, that, that's just in speaking in a general sense. But uh, White Scars have the ability to get into the Iron Hands and not let them do their thing. For example, you take a... Uh, I've been calling him the snatch captain, the catch captain, whatever. Yeah, <laughs> the one with captain. the four up. Uh, so just so you guys know, the he can take a, a warlord trait where on a four up, you can't run away from him in close combat. So carry on, sorry. Yep. <laughs> yep. No, 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 that's exactly exactly correct. And you put him on the con on a bike, He and then you give him the ghost rider bike, which uh, lets you move 16 inches in the movement phase. You ignore, you move through other things like basically as if you had the fly keyword, and then you can advance six automatically, and charge. So you're talking about a 22 inch move and then a you know potentially 12 inch charge, and then you can get up to a plus three on your charge. So uh, and and your advance as well actually. So you could be moving 25 inches and then another 15. It's ridiculous how fast he is, and because of the way Iron Hands typically play, you're gonna you we're often seeing him with triple repulsor or lots of dreadnoughts or something like that all clustered around the model with the iron stone. So catch captain, snatch captain, whatever you want to call him. He power slides in to two of those models, ignoring overwatch with a psychic power, which you're not guaranteed to get, but it's very easy to hide him and charge from out of line of sight. If statistically, if he can touch two of those units, he has about a 90% chance of holding one of them in combat. So okay. now think about getting in there and touching two repulsor executioners and then charging the rest of your, or as much of your army as you can into both of those units after he's turned off their overwatch. And he holds even just one of them in combat and the rest of your army can't be shot. You probably just won the game because white scars can then leave combat oftentimes still shoot and charge. So it's 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 just too much pressure. You're going to have good odds of getting there, killing the Ironstone, killing Pharaohs, and just stopping them from shooting, which is all you have to do uh, to, to, win that, to win that game. And then, of course, once you get to turn three and you go Super Saiyan, it's, 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 it's mind-boggling how much damage White Scars do in combat once they get to turn three. Yeah, no, the plus one dam anything that gives plus one damage is just, like, on top of the world. <laughs> I love plus it, one damage. It, and plus one AP, and you can get plus one to wound, and you can get plus one strength. Yeah. So you could have a guy with a chain sword wounding a knight on fours at AP one, doing two damage a hit. Ugh. It's It's bonkers how good they are once you get to that point. Like, every single unit in your game becomes a melee powerhouse. Uh, intercessors, scouts, scout bikers, even your tanks are scary in combat. It sounds like how like world eaters should play. Should play, right? <laughs> <laughs> Come on. I, Come on, GW world eaters. Let's go. <laughs> so, and, and you know, I, I'll give you a little, like a, a fun little uh, a teaser, I guess, or a, something to consider is they've said that uh, Psychic Awakening is going to touch on most, if not all armies in the game. I would imagine if uh, you know you play you play an army that's a melee army, and you feel like, well, what about me? Maybe Psychic Awakening is going to give you what you're hoping for. So, uh, and maybe if you're a, a Chaos Face Premium player, you might be really happy. We'll see, right? Yeah. But um, do, hopefully, people just don't feel like they're just left out in the cold for forever. Uh, Psychic Awakening is going to help a lot, I think. 
Yeah, no, and I and I I think a lot of people are worried right now because looking at the elder stuff, like some of it looks pretty good, uh, but overall it seems you know underwhelming in comparison, which everybody always uses comparisons, right? Like it's hard as a chaos space marine or chaos player to be not butt hurt after <laughs> what we got with the two point codex, and then we see what marines get, you know. Um, and I get it, we got new models with Lord Discordant, which is awesome, um, and, and some of the other stuff, but. Uh, just the reprinted codex just i felt i i felt insulted a little bit like y'all couldn't even get the right point values in here you know it was kind of weird right like it's like we haven't seen anything like that in the edition and like on the one hand it was cool because it gave all your new stuff in there but on the other hand it was like as a consumer like you you're definitely expecting new stuff i i mean not just new uh, data sheets but like new rules updated rules so from that perspective, yeah, it was it was a kind of a strange product, um, but you know perhaps Psychic Awakening is going to be something that's much more exciting for you. And I I I, I will tell you for sure, um, Psychic Awakening impacts different armies differently, and that the Eldar one I think is one of the more tame, um, is one of the more tame ones in my opinion. Yeah, no, and I know you can't let let anything out of the bag. You know, you're privy to information that everybody would love to know, but yeah, you know, do not disclose and all that fun stuff, which is fine. Um, now on the subject of chaos, now uh, I've been toying with the idea, and and you kind of alluded to it. You know, you have the snatch captain. Well, in comparison, you know, chaos has the contorted epitome, which more or less is the exact same thing, except uh, it's an aura. You know. Um, yeah. You, so, that 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 should be in every chaos list, <laughs> right? Like, and and I actually, uh, we actually were just talking about this today. So I have a Discord channel for the channel, and uh, we were talking about this. And I was like, "What about three hell drakes and a contorted epitome?" And somebody is like, "Oh, we'll call it the sticky chicken list." And I was like, "No, we'll call <laughs> we'll call this General Sow's uh, takedown." <laughs> yeah, dude, that's or the tarred and feathered. <laughs> like, there's that's that's great. There's so many fun things you could come up with out of that. But, I mean, I, I think it sounds valid, you know, because uh, talking to Don Hooson, you know, even though he's quick chaos and he's a traitor. Sorry, Don. <laughs> <laughs> he's a he's, traitor, traitor. <laughs> yeah, he is. He's a sub, too. He's a subscriber, and I talk to him all the time. And uh, I call him a traitor now because uh, he plays Imperial Fist. So. Uh, but anyways, he he illuminated to me. He's like, you know, uh, and he gave me an example of, you know, three knights. So he, he drew the bases of the three knights around a repulsor. And he's like, you know, and he did the measurements and everything. He's like, you know, a repulsor cannot fall back if you surround it with knights or something with the large bases because the bases yeah. are too large. They don't and move I was far like, enough. Right. And I was like, well, if you're getting to that point with knights, you've pretty much won. Like, you know what I mean? There's no way to get three knights around a repulsor usually. Oh, and, and chaos knights especially will absolutely obliterate like there won't be a repulsor left. Like you don't, right. you don't even have to. You don't even have to worry about that. If you take the relic, the relic fist on a melee knight and you get there, uh, that is a dead repulsor, possibly two. That 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 thing is bananas good. Right, and and so that was the other case. I was like, how is it going to live through this? You know. But on the flip side, now we're talking about hell drakes, right? They have, I think, the same base size. So um, they, they do. Yeah. Oh they, no, it's it's. It's not as it's not as long, but it's dang it's very close in in uh, size. So it almost feels like we could possibly pin something in <laughs> turn one because you know those hell drakes move thirty two inches, and if we're talking about Slanesh, well now you know you can do the locust where you advance and charge. Um, and Does so, that work on the hell drakes? Yeah, uh, because oh, they're, they're, Sl they're Slanesh they're demons. demons, so. Um, yeah, you might be you might be onto something there, and then they also get bonuses to hit against uh, fly keyword models as well. Oh, yep, yep, they do get that, which the repulsor would count. But <laughs> but this yeah. is this is just spitball, you know. Some some things we were talking about, and I was like, huh. And so uh, oddly enough, my wife sent me a hell drink in the mail today, <laughs> uh, just <laughs> a surprise, and uh, got this conversation going. So I think. You're onto something, you know, with your snatch captain, and and we can do the same thing too. Yeah, and and that's what on our podcast today we were just uh, just talking about this. It was we we're like look for things in your army that can ignore Overwatch, that can hold people in combat, that can uh, hit characters, 
because Iron Hands are well, dep- depending on the list, uh, the Repulsor list and the Dreadnought list, which I think are what most people are looking at right now. I think the Air Force is going to be the real problem, but those are very dependent on characters to make them function. Uh, to give out the, the, the BS2+, plus, the plus one to hit, uh, the Iron Stone, the five-up invul save, et cetera, et cetera. They really want those characters to be around. So Chaos have some of the best options for uh, direct um, targetable smites. So that that's going to be one of your best tools to look at, oh, who has the Iron Stone? Oh, you put it on a Tech Marine who only has four wounds. But I feel pretty confident I could take that guy out with you know, Aramon and, and whoever else, um, uh, even though you don't have any really like sniper options, you have really good sniper like abilities in the psychic phase. And if you can take out that Ironstone or Pharaohs or whatever, and you're facing one of those lists, it just became dramatically easier to kill the vehicles, right? They're, they're, they're twice times two easier to kill. Right. And then we also have access to, you know, Infernal Gateway, which uh, is a really good power if somebody clop like, groups up um right yeah totally yeah i mean you hit a repulsor with that three inches around a repulsor is a a pretty big area so (laughs) yeah 100 percent. and one of the other ones that we were talking about too is uh warp talons with the um raptoral raptorial horse host excuse me uh the turn they deep strike they ignore overwatch because chaos has very unfortunately very few options to ignore overwatch it's really annoying um, but that's one of the few that you have and you could drop down a unit of warp talons. They, they're still over costed and under effective, even with the plus one attack on the charge that helps obviously, but it's still not making them any kind of melee powerhouse, but you could drop down, you could give them some bonuses to charge and, uh, it's not a guarantee, but that's something that you could think about using too, um, to, to get in there and ignore the, the punishing overwatch of those repulsors and dreadnoughts and, and, and tag them. And then let the rest of your army charge uh, without uh, avoiding the Overwatch. Yeah, no, and they are also demons, and they you can also be Slanesh, meaning you can also advance a charge with them. So, <laughs> yeah, that's that's a very good point. Uh, uh, and some of the other ones, like a Disco Lord from the Flawless Host, is still going to just obliterate a, a a Repulsor, and most of the Dreadnoughts will kill too. Um, you you have really good options. The, the, the only thing that annoys me. Uh, for as a chaos player in that matchup is that a lot of it depends on going first, um, depending on what units you take, especially with things like disco lords and knights and stuff. Like you, you almost have to go first. Uh, Heldrakes maybe a, a little bit more survivable because they can be so far away. Um, but that, that's the part that annoys me uh, in that matchup. It's like, oh, I go first and I can get into them and melee right away. I crush them. I go second. I get crushed. It's like, eh. That's not a super fun game. No, and I, and we were talking about this today. Like uh, when you have the fifty fifty shot, you know, if I go first, I win. If I, if I don't, I lose. Um, you still lose half the time. So <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's not it's not fun. And it, it, and to circle back around to what we were talking about earlier, this is why terrain is so hyper important. Um, you need to be able to hide. Like now, it's like to the point where you you want to even be able to hide a knight. You know, like, yeah, because a, a knight is not what it was like a, a, a iron hands or especially an imperial fists army. If they're in range and line of sight, that is the knight is a bl- it's 100 percent going to die. Yep. Nope. 100 percent. It almost feels like we've kind of when I came into eighth, you know, it was very gun liney and a very uh, deep strikey because, you know, either you deep struck to not get shot off the board or you shot stuff right. off the board. And it feels like we've kind of circled back around to that almost. <laughs> Again, terrain, 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 terrain. We've yeah. been saying it the whole edition. The, the eighth edition is, a, is, in my opinion, it's the best edition of the game so far. Uh, the, I think the numbers prove that. I loved fifth edition for tournaments, but um, uh, we've been saying it from the beginning. In eighth edition, if you don't have good terrain, it's not fun, and it's a complete Alpha Strike shooting edition. No, 100% agree. Um, so kind of on the subject of chaos, uh, this be pretty much the last thing we talk about. So you, as a uh, White Scars player, so we're going we're gonna to talk about it from a White Scars perspective, I guess. Uh, what do you not like to see when a chaos player brings it? 
So the things I have found as a, a White Scars player that plays pretty much an all infantry army, the things that actually scare me the most are berserkers. Uh, the the fighting twice, the AP one is just enough. Um, hitting on threes, wounding on threes, often wounding on twos. They wreck my uh, infantry, but it comes down to who charges whom. So that that one is pretty scary, especially with like red Corsairs, Berserkers, even though they don't get veterans of the long war. They're so fast. They can advance and charge. You can warp time them. Um, they, they do a number on me. The Disco Lords are not as bad for me because with an infantry army, I can just feed them a unit or I can move block them with a scout. And it's like, whatever, you know, you killed the unit, then I killed you. It's not a big deal. Um, those, those have been the most challenging things to deal with. And then Chaos Knights as a White Scars player are challenging because I, I need turn three to actually kill them. Uh, I only have one shooting unit that's going to do really anything to them prior to turn three. And they're so fast and they hit so hard that uh, Chaos Knights with uh, double Gatling or the melee version or the battle cannon version really can just just do – they can do more damage to me than I can recover from when I finally get to turn three. Th those are the ones I found to be uh, the most problematic uh, as, a, as a White Scars player. That's really interesting. Uh, so on the subject of Berserkers, have you seen anybody use... Because the biggest problem with Berserkers, they do tons of damage. It's getting them there that I've found. Because uh, I love them. I love their profile. I think that they're super effective. But other than like a, an assault drill, I can't really think of any other way that I would get them to my opponent, you know? So two things that we've done on, on my team, Team Zero Comp, which has a lot of like dedicated Chaos players. Two things we've done that worked... And whether or not it's worth the points investment for the people listening to this, it's up to them. Because the way I do it, you could get like two Disco Lords. So I don't know if that's better or worse, but I'm, I'm committed to making them, to playing them because I love them. I run nine in a Rhino with Huron. I give Huron warp time and then I use the CP to then give him a uh, prescience. Turn one, I move, advance, pop smoke. Typically speaking, turn. this is what I do on turn one. It depends on who you're playing, you may be able to execute your plan earlier. Typically, I move them, it, try, try to hide them, uh, go up the table as far as I can, pop smoke, and uh, hang tight. Usually, no one shoots them because uh, I've got you know other threats that are up in their face. Turn two, disembark, warp time. They're charging anything on the table. Uh, they, they, it's their, their reach out of the rhino with warp time is dumb. It, oftentimes you don't even need warp time um, because you, if you've gotten, if you've moved up the table, like 10 inches, 12 inches, you don't even need it anymore. But um, with it, you can move into position to charge from out of line of sight, etc. That for me has worked extremely well uh, with a unit of nine. They're not going to just, you know, totally wreck things in combat, but I find that I can go in and touch bad touch a huge percentage of my opponent's army and just, really jam them up especially with attacking twice the extra movement that you get you can go so deep into your opponent's army <clears throat> and the other way that my uh, one of my teammates james has been playing them which is totally different uh, he's taking a fortification i can't remember the name of it but he puts a unit of 20 berserkers in the <laughs> fortification and uh gets out uh, obviously you get an extra basically four and a half inches of movement when you disembark Move, warp time, go into to, to melee. He has done, he has, the, the amount of damage of four unit 20 berserkers with prescience and veterans will do is ridiculous. Like he's gone in and killed multiple knights with one unit of berserkers. <laughs> you know, it's crazy how much damage they do. And the fortification is resilient enough that oftentimes it survives. It'll, 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 It'll make it. And even if it does die, your berserkers weren't taking all that firepower. Yeah. Huh. That's, that's really interesting to me. Uh, cause this is actually a common, common point of contention with a lot of units. It's like, uh, you know, for example, Havocs, um, it's, it's how to get them there, you know, which, right. and, and right. with Havocs, you know, we've seen, uh, only a few people use them and usually it's like one unit and they're like the least threatening thing. And so that's why they survive, you know? 
Yeah, I mean, uh, maximum threat an MTO list like Jim like Jimmy used to talk about all the time. Uh, MTO list is when you throw so many uh, threats in front of your opponent that they it's it's difficult to choose what to shoot. You can really sneak some stuff in there that wouldn't have normally made it. Like if you send one unit of berserkers up the table, they're dead. <laughs> Don't even bother, right? But in my list now, my current list, I'm going up the table with two knights. Uh, uh, or sometimes three, and some melee characters. The Berserkers are at the bottom of the prior target priority scale. So they're much more likely to make it. Yeah. So you have a current Chaos list you're playing around with? Care to share? Yeah, yeah of course. So let me tell you about Frankie's first, because his is better than mine. What? Frankie's uh, playing Chaos Knights? What? Yeah, he's, he's taking a double Gatling Knight, melee Knight, uh, the double Lightning Lock, uh, War Dog, I can't remember the name of it, the Forge World one. That guy is stupid good at clearing screens. My goodness, he's underpriced. Um, but uh, double Gatling, melee, double Lightning Lock, Mortarian, uh, two Disco Lords and the Flawless Host, and then uh, uh, Cultist just to fill out and get some CP. He has been smashing people with that army. It's really, really good. If he goes first, it's usually not much of a game, which, again, I don't know if that's a positive thing for the game or not, but as a Chaos player, put that in your back pocket. My, mine is slightly less effective. It's still really good. <clears throat> I'm taking a double battle, battle cannon knight, double Gatling cannon knight, melee knight, uh, red corsairs, three units of five, um, uh, bolter chainsword, uh, Chaos Space Marines, Huron, a biker lord, unfortunately, he's not long for this world, as we all know now. So with sad. the, uh, yeah, I'm so sad. He's so good. With the relic combi melta, and then nine berserkers and a rhino. Huron rides with him. It's, it's a really good army, but it has some matchups that are almost an auto lose. Like Gene Stealer Colt, if they go second against me, I have almost a zero percent chance of winning. Tau, I, I, it's almost impossible to defeat them, even if I go first. So it's a fun army, and it's an army if you take it to a tournament. I would expect to go four and two, but have a lot of fun, and the games are really quick. So I don't know if that's appealing to people that want to try to win the tournament, but I, I've had a lot of fun with it. Yeah, I think right now, uh, with the current state of things, uh, with everybody trying to hash things out, I think right now going to a tournament and just trying to do your best is probably the best option. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I mean, I always tell people to do that anyway. Only one person ever wins. It's probably not going to be you, even if you're really good. So it's it's like, really, you're better off taking an army that's fun and going into it, accepting the fact that you're probably going to lose a couple games and it's not that big of a deal. No, that's true. I'm actually taking a Nurgle Demon Engines list to my first GT, and I do not plan on winning it. <laughs> it's a fun army. A guy in our one of my uh, our employees has a Nurgle Demon Engine Army, and he doesn't win all of his games. He wins way more than 50% of his games, and it's really, really fun, and your opponent has fun too because they're like, what's this? This is cool. This is something totally new. Like, this is a blast, you know? So it, it creates a fun experience, and that's, in my opinion, more important uh, for, for, for longevity, for enjoying this game over your lifetime. That's definitely more important. No, that's that's a great point, and I, I like that. I like that focus on not win at all costs, and I have to win all my games and uh, smash my opponents. So, uh, and I, I want to see your your friend's Nurgle Demon engine list. <laughs> it's and it's beautiful too. He's one. He's basically the head painter of our paint studio, so it's an absolutely gorgeous army as well. Um, it's 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 cool. You know, it's it's a lot of fun, super resilient. You can double heal. There's actually some really cool mechanics in there. Um, but, you know, sometimes you just can, you know, like a, a good Tau army will outshoot him or Eldar Flyers. He's like, I can't really interact with you. So there's some bad matchups, but it's not a bad army at all. Yeah, no, and, and that's why I'm super interested because as you guys who watch the channel know, I have done probably 30 battle reports with my Nurgle Demon Engines at this point. So... <laughs> What, how, how are you batting on that? I'm actually doing really well. Uh, I've only lost... Now, like, I'd, I'm not necessarily, like, top-tier meta, but I've only lost one game with it. That's 
That's pretty good, dude. <laughs> yeah, and it was against Knights, and it was my very first time playing it. And uh, I was proxying a Lord Discordant when they had just come out. I was like, you know what, I'm going to try this guy out. I charged him into a Knight, and he killed me with Endless Fury on Overwatch. I would never encountered that relic, and, and he rolled so many sixes... Oh, and yeah. <laughs> just straight killed the Lord Discordant on the charge. I was like, well, that was cool. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. It, it's it, it, the, the biggest thing you can do, like I've told, I've said I, countless times, if you want to get better at the game, read every codex. That's literally, how many times have you lost a game when you walked up to a table and you're like, oh, this is my first time. I've never played Gene Sealer Cold. Where you're like, well, you are about 99% likely to lose this game. <laughs> You know, like, that's true well and i had experience against knights but um this was when uh you know with the castellan and 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 you know uh uh house raven so i knew what house raven did you know everybody knew what house raven did but uh this was right after all that and and you know he was like oh yeah i'm house crass and i got this endless fury relic i was like oh what is that he's like it's a 14 shot avenger gatling cannon i was like okay that doesn't sound too bad and then he neglected to tell me that it generated two hits on every six <laughs> Yeah. So when yeah, I and charged it's, it's just, into it, I was like, what? <laughs> it's like G.I. Joe taught us as kids, man, knowing is half the battle. And that, that's it. Like, the, the, the difference between a player who is good and a player who is great is, like, a very small margin of knowledge. You know, it's, it's, it's not a lot. To, to make the jump from being a competent to a very good player, it's, it's a lot of work, but the the, the difference is tiny, you know? It's like you put in twice as much effort to get a 2% increase. <laughs> and uh, I think that's true of just most, th most things in life, actually. Right, and I, I find I get better just by playing. Uh, I, yeah. I'll, I'll hop in, you know, after a game, I'll hop in Vital Scribe and stuff and look at the person's army. But, uh, yeah, just, just play games, you know? Go out there, yeah. play new armies. Don't play your buddy with the same army all the time. That's not how you get better. Play different people. 100 <laughs> percent, and 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 don't take it too seriously like do, compete do your best you know try try to win games but don't take it too seriously right like don't let it ruin your day and i i have found that i have gotten better at the game as i have relaxed right when i was younger i was dead set on winning all the time now it's like if i lose i'm like ah, eh, the sun's gonna come up tomorrow i'm gonna be fine and i find that when i'm in a relaxed state I think more clearly and I am better at the game. No, that's a, that's a great point. And I, that's something I personally need to take to heart. Um, especially lately I've been getting really spun up, but I think that's life, you know, <laughs> you go through those ups and flows. <laughs> yeah. hundred percent. And when you're a competitive person, like if you grew up playing sports and stuff, like most of us did, uh, or whatever, you know, even, you know, any, any, it doesn't have to be athletics. It could be anything where it's like, you're really trying to win and it matters to you. It's so easy to get emotionally invested into it and get like upset or you know the the the, the elation of victory and the the agony of defeat. But ultimately, if you take a step back and you're like, "This is a diversion. This is something I do for a good time," I think you, you'll see that you perform better because it's uh, you, you're just more calm. Yeah, that's great. No, that's great information and that's great advice. Uh... Especially because I'm embarking on my first GTs. I know a few of my other viewers <laughs> are also doing their first GTs. So wish everybody luck. So uh, that's that's great. It's always great to see people go to their first event. We call it getting the bug when they go to their first event and they're like, "That was so much fun!" Like you know, everybody was cool and welcoming and nice. They maybe been one dick, but you know, the majority of people were amazing. And they just start going to events like rapid fire. That's one of my favorite things in the hobby is to see people get the bug and just get so excited. They're like, oh, what's the next event? I can't wait to go. It's great. Yeah, no, and I can't wait to come out to one of y'all's. Uh, it's, it's definitely on my bucket list. <laughs> but, uh, you know, being in the military, it's not uh, it's not as – you don't have the time all the time. So Yeah, totally, dude. And your, your, your long-term schedule is always in flux, so to totally get it. Yeah, you deal with a lot of military guys. So, uh, But no, thank you for coming on the channel, and thank you for the long chat. And I, I hope uh, some of my listeners take something away. It was a pleasure being here, and um, invite me back anytime. Yeah, of course. I, 
I always invite people. I always bug, and you know me, I bug people. <laughs> it's, all, it's all good, man. Yeah, you, sometimes you gotta. I, I'm a small fish in a, a big pond, so sometimes I gotta make my voice louder than it really is. So. <laughs> The squeaky wheel gets the grease, dude. So, exactly, exactly. Yeah. So, uh, thank you guys for listening. Thank you, Reese, and check out Frontline Gaming. I mean, obviously, almost everybody plays ITC. So, uh, if you haven't heard of Frontline Gaming, well, you're, you're living under a rock somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> and you're welcome to come out of the rock and come and have fun with everybody else. <laughs> Hell yeah! All right, man. I'll talk to you later. All right, have a good one, bro. Bye.